it gives me very great pleasure this evening to welcome our speaker today, David Enden from New York. I, I have, uh, I happen to know David and known him, uh, since 1968 when we were more or less thrown together on the on Orpan in Beersheba in Israel. And already then we both made it known that we were interested in ancient numismatic. Um, now, since that time, David has achieved an enormous, uh, it's got a, an enormous range of achievements yeah, under his, uh, under his belt. He has had several in parallel, uh, several highly distinguished careers as a medical journalist, as a literary agent, and as of course, a numismatic uh, scholar alongside some archeological work. And in all of them, he has achieved, um, quite a lot of accolades um, in, in every one of them and um, has in also authored 16 books on various subjects in various fields. I shall dwell briefly on David Endon's achievements in numismatic scholarship. I could spend half an hour talking about his achievements, which are legion, but I suppose like myself, you want to hear from him, you want to hear his talks, so I'll be brief. Um, among his books, the best known is his a very authoritative guide to biblical coins, which is now in its sixth edition. It has become the Bible of numismatists specializing in the Levant, and auction houses use it as a standard reference. You'd see references, um, ended references, uh, or to catalog numbers to all the coins that they present, and that's almost without exception. Um, apart from its comprehensive catalog of Judean and related coins, um, it contains a wealth of information on complementary topics covering metrology, history, chronology, technology, conservation, just to name but a few topics. Marvelous stories as well that he includes. And I strongly recommend that you buy it, even if your primary interest is not in numismatics. It's a great treasure to have and beautifully illustrated as well. Uh, David is um, the first prime, uh, first vice president and honorary curator of the American Numismatic Society, which granted him the ANS um, trustee award in, um, uh, earlier this year. He has, as I mentioned, um, also participated in archeological activities, um, and field work, uh, particularly at Sephoris in 1985, 1986, and 2011, um, with Eric Myers at the Duke University, uh, which was, um, uh, engaged in this project together with the Hebrew University. Without any more ado, I call on David to give his talk this evening, which will be about money in Judea, Bronze Aid to Bar Kokhba. Thank you, David. I'm, I'm going to sh share my screen, but I have to correct you. We met in September of 1967 when you arrived in Bershep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then we basically lost contact for almost 30 years until, until we uh, met each other again. Uh, all right, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Share. Okay, now from beginning. Oh, there it is. Okay. Now, I did notice a bunch. Of, I can't, by the way, I just want to say that I can't see any Bob. Uh, Messages you send, but David Jesselson will uh, will will keep uh, uh, David Jacobson will keep track of that. Yeah, uh, again, I I saw uh, some of you who are here. Lots of you here know uh, a lot more than I do about uh, uh, Judean history uh, and and even numismatics. But uh, this is a quick tour, so uh, it's going to cover high spots and things that I like. So here we go. Um, the first thing that I like to tell people, 
when I give a lecture like this is that we have to be careful not to look at things that have to do with money and commerce anachronistically. What do I mean by anachronistically? Well, we all have grown up in societies where we use money. Money is paper, dollars, uh, coins, uh, pounds, euros. Uh, and we say, well, people have always used that. You know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, sure, but not 2,000 years ago. And the only way that I can explain it to all of you very clearly is to ask you about communications you had with uh, about friends, uh, relatives, business associates 25 years ago. Not a single one of them was an email or instant message. Uh, and this is where we've come in only about 30 years, 40 years. Uh, and so we can look back to uh, a time, you know, when there were no iPhones, but we really, it's almost impossible for our minds to wrap around the concept of an entire society operating without money, but, uh, uh, or without coinage. But they did. They used different things as money. Uh, they did a lot of training, which we today call barter. Uh, barter is not an ancient concept. If you Google the word barter, you'll get over 10 million hits, uh, at many of which are active barter sites uh, where you can barter today. Uh, this is a, 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 a line drawing from uh, an ancient uh, Egyptian tomb uh, that shows the weighing of these uh, rings, probably of gold, intended to be uh, reflect gold, being weighed against this zoomorphic weight. Uh, probably uh, this dates to around 2000 BC. Uh, and indeed, these are uh, zoomorphic weights that... Uh, 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 came into the market in Israel uh, uh, when I bought them in the 70s. By the way, all, uh, uh, all the weights you see here are in the Israel Museum now. I donated the entire collection after I finished writing the book. But here you have uh, this uh, weight is almost exactly like the one that was shown uh, in, in the previous drawing. A frog, a lion, all kinds of symbols that were just commonly used. Remember, we think a frog is kind of gross, right? Uh, and they say croak or ribbit, but in ancient times they were symbols of fertility, as slimy as they are, um, because when the Nile overflowed, uh, um, the fertile fields were thick with frogs when when they were at their highest fertilities. So what were they weighing? What kind of pieces of metal were they weighing? Well, here uh, 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 Exodus gives us a clue. The golden earrings, which were in the ears of your wives and your sons. By the way, you know, not only hippies uh, wear earrings uh, when they're men. In ancient times, uh, men may have worn earrings or nose rings. And these date uh, to approximately that period, 2000 BC. Um, this is an example of a weight from the C Syrian, uh, the city of Hamat, which is in current day Syria. Um, the reason I show you this is that I want to underline that ancient weights, scale weights, were not a form of currency, and they were not made of precious metals. They were made of stone or bronze or lead, and they were only used to weigh precious metals. They were not a commodity in their own right. That's something that people misunderstand. There were Judahite weights in the Judean period. This one was is 40 shekels. 441 grams, and this tiny one uh, uh, was only 1.19 grams, uh, also by now in the Israel Museum. Uh, sometimes they're inscribed, sometimes they're not. I think that the ones that are not inscribed were probably once inscribed with paint, but we don't know for sure. And, of course, one of the things that started to be weighed uh, as we moved through uh, the first millennium was th this stuff, this silver that they poured out on the dirt uh, until it was flat as a pancake, and then they hacked it up like a chocolate bar, and there were these little pieces of hack silver. As far as we know, hack silver was not denominational. You can find hack silver of all different weights. So if you see one shekel hack silver, I think it's probably coincidental not deliberate. Uh, as I say, I have not seen any uh, uh, 
with denominational inscriptions. But these were used so people might carry a pocket full of bees into the market at a certain time. At other times, there may have been markets that were established that were simply markets that people walked through carrying some of their own produce or their own uh, things that they made, their own handicrafts, and traded them on the spot. Or there may have been systems that we just don't know about. Uh, and don't and and the the reality is, I mean, Chris Halgabo says this. We just can't fully understand all of the things surrounding uh, uh, the use of money before coinage, and it, it, in the same way, we can barely uh, understand fully the inter uh, you know the use of coinage in ancient times. Here's some more weights. These are lead, and these were apparently from Phoenician cities. Tyre. Uh, 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 Biblos or Beirut, another tire, and uh, the, the helmets of the diastri, who knows, but one of the Phoenician cities. Uh, and weights continued to be used after coins uh, began to circulate. So coins came into uh, the ancient land of Israel in the uh, late in the 6th or early in the 5th century. They began to be minted there in the fourth century. Here is a Herodian uh, weight set that is well after the introduction and established use of coins. But they were still using these weights in the market because the system of buying and selling with coins was not exclusive or unique, just like when, uh, when, when mobile phones were introduced before even the iPhone. They were not universal. Now, today, the iPhone or a comparable thing to the iPhone, a smartphone, is almost universal, but it's still not. And uh, believe me when I say that the use of coins, uh, uh, even for hundreds of years after they were introduced, were similar. By the way, this Herodian weight has an inscription. This is an interesting example of a Herodian limestone weight that after they made the weight, they realized it wasn't heavy enough. So they drilled a hole in it and they pounded in a piece of lead uh, to make it an accurate weight. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very interested in these weights because at a certain point, uh, the name of God or religion came into play. Uh, actually, we have some much earlier weights that mention the sun god, but uh, in the Byzantine times, it became very uh, common. Uh, I, I, this is this is one of the favorite weights that I've ever seen. It's as I say, it's now in the Israel Museum, but it says Agios uh, Paulos Tarso, uh, Saint Paul of Tarsus, and that must be one of the earliest uh, attempted uh, uh, images of Saint Paul ever created. But the whole idea of uh, invoking the name of God, and by the way, in the markets in the Middle East and even throughout the world today. I would say that in buying, selling, training, and negotiating, the name of God is often invoked, uh, even today. Um, of course, today we're living in a transitional age. We're getting ready to live without money or weights. We have digital scales of all sorts. We don't need uh, uh, weights anymore. Uh, we have electronic transfer of money. Um, again, I still carry bills in my pocket, but I will not carry coins in my pocket. If I find them there at the end of the day, I throw them in a drawer. Uh, it's just not worth it. And so we are living in a really, really fascinating transitional time here. Because what I dare say that when most of us were born, there were not digital scales. Uh, or if there were, there were few and rare, like the computers that existed that were the size of one room uh, or two. Uh, that were even that kind of computer when I was in college in the 60s. And today we're all sitting here looking at our own personal computers that take up hardly any space. But, so the, 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 the use of coins, as they say, came in now, uh, came into the ancient Holy Land in around the 5th century BCE or late in the 5th or the 4th. Uh, because I'm focusing this lecture on the Judean coins, I'm going to start with the Persian period through the Hellenistic coins that were made for the satrap of Judea and apparently struck somewhere in Judea, whereas the first uh, mint was probably around Gaza. Well, this is uh, 
seven uh, coins sitting on top of a U.S. one cent, uh, just to give you an idea of how how, how small they are. Uh, they weigh, in general, less than half a gram, some as little as two-tenths of a gram. And again, it takes a lot of imagination to understand how those coins were used in circulation. They're so small. Uh, there was one group of these coins that apparently refer to the prayer of the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And that is these two coins, one that has an ear, which my teacher Yaakov Meshwar suggested was the ear of God, and the other one carrying the image of a shofar, which is one of the ways that the Jewish people in ancient times communicated with God. The shofar was blown to uh, signify the beginning of Sabbath, the end of Sabbath, as well as other celebrations. And I would say that this is as close as one can come to a uh, to to the earliest uh, coin that actually references uh, the Jewish uh, uh, religion in one way or another. And this says, of course, Yehud uh, on this particular coin. It's in retrograde, and so if the letters don't look right to you, that's why because they're backwards. Well, the next period uh, after the Yehud coins, uh, we enter the Seleucid period. And of course, there's a, there's a rich history of, of the Seleucids in, in, the, in the ancient southern Levant. But most people, when you talk about Seleucids with regard to Judea, the land of Israel, they think of Antiochus IV and his uh, 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 historic fight against the Maccabees, the Hasmoneans. Uh, led, of course, by Judah Maccabee. And of course, we don't know what Judah looked like, but we do have uh, some some modern interpretations of what he may have looked like. Uh, that's not a real Judah, but that's that's a real family tree. And the ones, the names here in capital letters are the ones we today believe uh, actually struck coins of the Hasmonean dynasty. And now I'm going to take you on a little tour of those coins uh, First, the first coins that were struck in the Jerusalem Mint that was apparently uh, the mint under Hyrcanus I, because it was after his rule began, were these two coin types of Antiochus VII, uh, uh, with his name and with uh, sort of classical uh, 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 Seleucid types uh, of the anchor, uh, the aphlaston, and the helmet. Uh, and this lily... Uh, is apparently um, intended to be some sort of a reference to the uh, fact that the, that the coin was issued in Jerusalem. These coins were only issued and dated in three years, as far as we know. And shortly after them, uh, Hyrcanus I uh, himself began to issue coins. He issued coins in a denominational set, which is interesting. This is apparently the equivalent of two units. We call, today we call these units prutot. I want to say to you that uh, I believe that's about as accurate as you can use as in a Hebrew or Jewish relating word uh, because the Talmud ref uh, refers to these coins as prutot. Uh, they're in the neighborhood of two gram coins. This is a two prutot, and by the way, if you take a look at this helmet, you will maybe recall, well, I'll show you, that that is an almost identical helmet to this uh, Antiochus VII Seleucid helmet. And that actually brings me to something that I, I, I wanted to comment on at the very beginning, because when I first be began to study the Judean numismatics in the 60s, um, there was a, 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 a very... Uh, patriotic group of uh, young Israelis going to college and doing higher education and studying the symbolism and collecting these coins. And all of these symbols were referred to basically as Jewish symbols, you know. Uh, uh, and the fact is that what really happened was that the people who were responsible for minting the Judean coins look for symbols in the earlier coins of the area, and that means the Seleucid coins. But they looked for symbols that would be compatible 
with uh, w w with the, uh, the, the Jewish uh, uh, way, and those were without graven images. And so uh, maybe the helmet refers to uh, uh, victories of Hyrcanus. Uh, uh, the cornucopias in general uh, often refer to to plenty and you know to many other things. But these are the designs. And so we have two cornucopias, and in between the cornucopias, we have a pomegranate uh, or a poppy. Uh, uh, you can read an article that David Jesselson and I wrote together. Uh, for a while, I was quite convinced that it could only be uh, described as a pomegranate and after my early learning uh, that it was a poppy. But uh, uh, Jesselson, uh, uh, Jesselson, Jacob Sith, convinced me, uh, uh, and, we, and we wrote an article together that I think you'll find very interesting. So just to remind you or tell, explain to you that these inscriptions are written in Hebrew. This is pure Hebrew. Today, when you open a book, you're reading the Hebrew language, but it's written in Aramaic script. Uh, this is the Hebrew language written in the original Hebrew script, and this inscription says, Yehochanan, HaKohen HaGadol V'chever HaYehudi. And this is a, a lovely example where you can read every letter. What I would like to show you here is, uh, first of all, the three denominations, two prutot, these three are each one prutot, and this one is a half prutot. They all have essentially the same inscriptions, but take a look at the difference between this inscription and this inscription. Wow. Uh, here, for example, those two letters that I'm circling right there are two nuns. Now look at the two nuns on this coin. They look only like straight lines. Uh, this is because different die cutters used different sets of tools and achieved different results because of them. Today, numismatists like this because we can track some of these die cutters and understand some chronologies because of the way they worked. Here's one example. This is similar to the previous coin of Yehochanan with those two nuns. Here is an example of a very uh, uh, similarly cut coin, similarly uh, uh, in, uh, cut die, but this one says Yehuda. And here is another one that says Yehuda, and here is a die, but that has almost identical writing to this Yehuda, but this inscription is Yehon Tan. So this is Jonathan, which refers to Alexander Janaeus, who's the next ruler we'll see. And this is a coin of Hyrcanus. And here we have a coin of Judah matching not only the cornucopias, even the, this may even be the same die, matching not only the cornucopias, but the inscription style, and another one of the same Yehuda matching the inscription style of the later king. So this ha helps us place the coins of Aristobulus I, and indeed I wrote an article about this, um, helps us place the coins of Aristobulus as Aristobulus I, not as a, a, an Aristobulus II, who may or may not have be, uh, ruled under, uh, uh, under the name of Yehuda, we're just not sure. Uh, and here are the coins of Alexander Janaeus and his successors. Janaeus, first of all, was the first uh, Judean ruler to introduce Greek on his coins right here. He called himself King Alexander. And he also, on those very same coins, called himself King uh, Jonathan in Hebrew. Now, the interesting thing is that he never uses the first, this coin has his name Jonathan the high priest. He never uses the high priest and the king on the same coin. And he never uses the Greek legend together with the high priest inscription on the coin. So there are a lot of interesting politics here going on. Here is, uh, 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 again, this has been traditionally called a lily. However, to me, this is a lily. And this is a rose that is almost identical to the Rhodian rose that was stamped on jar handles that we absolutely know were used in the hundred years prior uh, to this and, uh, and during the time that these coins were issued. These are the tiny coins today that are most commonly called the widow's mites. We have archeological evidence that tells us 
that some of these were definitely struck and circulated during the reign of, during the life of Janaeus, but we also have strong suggestions that large numbers of these coins were made later, uh, after his death, but before the reign of Mattathias and Kittimus. By the way, uh, these symbols uh, that were used on coins, they didn't sit in their own universe. These are all rings uh, that were acquired in and around Jerusalem from uh, uh, the first century BC to the first century CE. Cornucopias, lily, rose-like flower, cornucopias with the caduceus, you'll meet that in a minute. These are some of the seven species. Here's a cornucopia with palm branches and a palm tree. Uh, these are all rings and intaglios. And I also know of amulets and bracelets that also carry some of the same inscriptions. The last of the Hasmonean kings to issue coins was Mattathias Antigonus. He ruled from 40 to 37, and it was a bit of a last resort for the Hasmoneans because already in the year 40, Herod the Great, Herod who we call Herod the Great, was, uh, was, had been named king in Rome, and he was king of Judea, but he was not king on the ground. It was Mattathias Antigonus who was king on the ground. He also issued a denominational set. This seems like it weighed eight prutas. This seems like it weighed four prutas. This weighed one pruta. These are his common coins. His rare coin is this pruta or small pruta sized that's quite rare still. Uh, with the menorah and the showbread table, uh, and in fact, the only ancient Jewish coin that carries the menorah, or the showbread table for that matter. Uh, the menorah coin, because it's so popular and so expensive, it's often uh, forged. Uh, for example, here is a forgery that was sent to me well, I don't know, half a dozen years ago, my friends at the Israel Antiquities Authority sent it, and they had confiscated it uh, on the West Bank. It turns out that it's a fake. Uh, it's a fake in, in the same family as these fakes. Some are good fakes, some are terrible fakes. Uh, these are uh, the coins that are believed to be genuine on this side. Here's one die that shows on top of this table stacks all of these sort of semicircles. And if you think about these semicircles, uh, you say, you know, the showbread table, everybody thinks about the showbread table in the temple, and I'm sure that everybody can see all the chalas sitting on the table there. But there were no chalas. The, the bread in ancient times was much more like a pita. And here is the showbread stacked on the table. And you see, if you stack up uh, a bunch of pita, they'll curve just exactly like that. And so those are the dyes uh, of, of some of the reels and the fakes. Now, uh, just to remind you that those coins, uh, ancient coins of Judea are struck, not cast. They, they were cast in strips of flans, blank flans, planches that looked like this. They have a little nipple on one side that corresponds with this hole that's from the drill that made these holes that butted together. And these were big trays. And there was another one that fitted on top of it. And they poured and they came up with strips of blanks. And then the strips were pulled through uh, uh, the dies and they were struck as coins. And this is uh, a, a collector friend of mine, David Sundwin. Uh, put this group together uh, from Agrippa coins where that had you know very clearly cut areas, and the coins were struck in a strip and then chopped apart. Uh, we actually have metallurgical proof of that, which is published in various articles. Uh, after, uh, or in fact, during the same time that Antigonus Mattathias was striking coins, or at least shortly after that time, Herod the Great did arrive. Uh, did vanquish uh, uh, Antigonus and his Parthian allies and bring in the not only the Herodian dynasty, but sort of formalize uh, the Romanizing of Judea. 
Uh, it started being Romanized uh, after Pauke's arrival, but the Romanization was really completed uh, under the Herodians. These are the coins of Herod the Great. He is never called the Great on his coins. We call him the Great uh, historically and traditionally because of his great building projects, etc. Uh, again, this is a denominational set, but it's a little bit tricky because coins that have the same diameter as the Mattathias Antigonus coins only weigh half as much. So the question is, are they eight prutotes or are they, uh, are they four prutotes? Uh, I suggest that they are four, two, one, or four, two, one, and one, or one and a half. But the issue, the point is that there was certainly some kind of adjustment going on here. There was probably a devaluation of the bronze. And the funny thing is about the devaluation of bronze, bronze is not really a very precious metal. The bronze coins were not really valued according to their weight. They were valued according to the value that the market and the users uh, and the government assigned to them. Uh, I know that you are all familiar with Herod. This is where Ehud Netzer found his tomb, uh, right here at Herodion. Uh, Herod also was the guy who built the Temple Mount, and this is what it looks like today, and this is the originally at the Holy Land Hotel, now at the Israel Museum model of the uh, Judean Temple in the time of Herod that originally sat right in this spot. Herod also had extensive palaces at Masada and at Macarus in Jordan, which is almost visible from each other on a clear day. Not really, but, you know, could be. And Herod also issued sort of ordinary coins. As the earlier coins that I showed you were dated. These are much cruder. Uh, and, you know, a tripod table. Uh, again, this may be a... A, a reference to tripod tables that were used in the temple and in Jerusalem. There have been tables found like this in the excavations of the old city. But again, the tripod itself is nothing new to Greek coins. A diadem with a cross inside may have referred to uh, 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 the, uh, the diadem referred to uh, the royal person and the cross may have involved the you know putting of a cross uh, in oil on the head of a, uh, of, of a new uh, uh, king. Uh, many people uh, suggest that this cross is somehow related to Christianity. It's impossible. Uh, and um, all of Herod's coins again say basically the same thing. King Herod, King Herod of King Herod. Uh, and uh, this is an example of one of the tripod tables. Uh, with a, a reconstruction of the legs, obviously, that is uh, in the museum uh, in the old city. Herod also, of course, built the most extensive port. And here, a lot of people think these are coral reefs, but this shadow, all the shadow is the ruin of Herod's port at Caesarea Maritima, uh, where they may or may not have struck some of his coins. I kind of doubt it. But there were these evaporated coins, the anchor, probably related, a half denomination with only one cornucopia and another half denomination with this uh, galley that may have been related. Uh, these may well have been related to Herod's um, uh, port at Caesarea. We just don't know. But again, King Herod, this is a noteworthy coin because it's the first Judean coin with any kind of a graven image of a living thing, the eagle. Uh, there were many references to uh, eagle at this time. Uh, uh, Summer earlier, many are mistaken. I'm, I'm not going to dwell on that here. That's for a, a, a more advanced conversation. Uh, also, the silver coins that circulated most commonly uh, during the Herodian period were the shekels of Tyre. And of course, the tekel, shekels and half shekels of Tyre were used um, as the payments to the temple. And uh, the, 
the, the shekels and the half shekels, and there was... So in the marketplace, we have very little evidence to suggest that there was anything other than 95% bronze coins used. Transactions in the marketplace were small. You know, you, for one of these Prutop coins, you could buy two pomegranates. So, you, you know, you maybe needed to have 20 or 30 Prutas in your pocket if you were going to the market. And as I say, shopping in those days wasn't the same as shopping is today anyway. So try not to make parallels. But at a certain point, when people wanted to pay their temple dues, they had to take their bronze coins, which they had accumulated and used in their daily lives, and trade them in for silver coins. And the same thing is true for pilgrims that came to Jerusalem that were going to make a pilgrimage to the temple. They had to trade in their coins for the shekels and the half shekels of Tyre. The exchange fee on a half shekel was two kalpanot, uh, according to the Talmud. And if you if you base a shekel uh, uh, at uh, two hundred and fifty six prutot at the, in this in the Roman period, then the kolban uh, is about eleven prutot. So I've shown you here the cost. If you if you wanted to trade your bronzes, your local bronzes, in for a half shekel. You would have to give uh, 11 uh, uh, prutot on top of the uh, uh, number of prutot that equaled the denomination that you wanted. Uh, but again, the money changers uh, commission was taken into consideration in many, many transactions. It's almost like today that in many, many transactions, they're taking into consideration a fee for uh, what master charge, uh, what MasterCard or what American Express charges. Uh, it, it, it's very similar to this. Herod the Great had three sons who struck coins, Archelaus, Antipas, and Herod Philip. Herod Philip was, in a way, the at least Judean, and he was also the first guy to put his own portrait, which is uh, right here, and the portrait of... Uh, here. Here's his portrait and the portrait of the king, Augustus, on a coin also. And all of his coins uh, uh, had a portrait of Augustus or Tiberius. They had a, a, a temple of Pontius. Uh, and uh, there's, there's very little to be seen as Jewish. In the next Herodian generation, we have Herod the Great's grandson, Agrippa I. He also issued coins that were totally conventionally Roman provincial, except for one coin that was struck in Jerusalem, and it shows the continuing sensitivity to coins with graven images, even in this period. And here we have a parasol that in ancient times was a symbol of royalty because they used to use it to keep the king in, uh, in shade. And uh, three ears of grain blooming here. Again, not unique, but very Judean because no graven images. Agrippa also did put his own image on coins. And by the way, uh, the only Herodian that was known as the great in ancient times was Agrippa. And here it says, Megas Agrippa, the great Agrippa uh, on this coin. But it's only Agrippa I, the grandson of Herod the Great. He was, of course... Uh, active uh, in the New Testament and was referred to often as Herod in the New Testament. He had a brother, Herod of Chalcus, issued coins, probably not issued in Judea, and his descendant Aristobulus of Chalcus, who issued the really famous coins with the portrait of Aristobulus uh, and Salome. And these were, I mean, 25 years ago, these coins were so rare that when I wanted to find a photograph of one for, for my book, I really had to dig for it. But in the, in the last 10 or 15 years, there have been dozens of them on the market. And obviously, there's a place where they were minted, probably uh, somewhere between Turkey and Syria, uh, 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 where that area is, where they're finding the coins. I don't think there was a hoard, but these amazing portraits of Salome and Aristobulus, uh, all uh, from recent years. 
Uh, and then there are these guys called the prefects and the procurators. And you know, we call these uh, Judean coins, they are certainly coins of Judea. There is no doubt about the fact that they were made to be used in the markets of Judea. But they're not Judean coins, they're Roman provincial coins, pure and simple. They don't, not only do they not carry any Judean names, they don't even carry any of the names of any of the prefects and procurators. They only carry the dates according to the Roman errors and the name uh, Caesar, uh, uh, Julia, uh, uh, and you know Tiberius Caesar, Britannicus. All, they have all different names that refer to the family of the ruling emperor, and they are all dated according to the ruling emperors. Yet, you'll find it very interesting that not a single one of those non-Jewish but Judean coins carries a graven image. The most disrespectful that we find are these few coins of Pontius Pilate that use the Lituus and the Singulum, which were very clearly uh, Aubrey, uh, you know, Roman uh, uh, symbols. Uh, and by the way, uh, we don't have much evidence of Pontius Pilate. As I said, certainly his name is not on his coins, but we have seen his name uh, on uh, this inscription found at Caesarea Maritima. And in fact, that's the only inscription that mentions uh, Pontius Pilate uh, at the time of Tiberius. The next step that we have is a very big and different step. The procurators were our non-Jewish Judean transition to the most Jewish coins that have been struck in Jerusalem, because these are the pure Jewish coins that were struck in during the Jewish revolt. And these coins, these are the shekels. There were half shekels, and there were also bronze. These coins were struck very elaborately and very beautifully by the Jews in Jerusalem at a very stressful time. They carry the inscriptions Shekel of Israel and in Jerusalem the Holy. They carry dates according to the war, one, two, three, four, and five. They carry some kind of a ritual chalice that changed in look from year one to the other years, but otherwise it's the same. It also appears on one of the bronze coins. And uh, in spite of earlier uh, suggestions that this was Aaron's rod blooming, in fact, it is some kind of a scepter with three bud uh, pomegranates. We know it's a scepter because it has this little uh, bulb at the bottom, something that's made. Those are the Judean shekels. They're remarkably pure in silver. They're remarkably true in weight. And they were struck by the Jews during the Jewish war to make a point. Uh, no more Greek on these coins. Uh, these are only Hebrew. By the way, a lot of people ask me what these coins look like when they're found. Uh, when you find a shekel in excavation, it almost always looks a lot like this. As you can see, this is the same coin after conservation. Um, and then there were, were, as I say, there were half shekels, there were bronzes. There was also this bronze coin that was minted only in Gamla that we know in very limited numbers. It has the same chalice. The inscription is in Aramaic. Uh, the inscription is controversial. I'm not going to talk about it today. It may refer to Gamla uh, itself. Um, there were only 15 or 20 of them that were found in the excavation there, but it's a crude copy of the Jerusalem issues made up in the north. Also, they made bronzes in the fourth year of the revolt. The fourth year was the siege of Jerusalem. It was almost the end of the war because the fifth year of the war was really very short. And look at these symbols that we find here with the Zionistic slogan, Ligulat Zion, uh, and Shemat Arba Ketsi, Shemat Arba Ravia, quarter, and Shemat Arba, which is an eighth of a shekel, and there's the ritual chalice. This is a etrog. These are Tulu Lavim, Tulu Lavim with etrog, and a date palm tree showing the collecting baskets for the dates, which is 
something that you would use in the harvesting season at the time of Sukkot. Um, by the way, even these symbols here, this is the coin. Here is a ring from the same time. Even these symbols are, are not necessarily unique. Uh, and of course, that fourth year led to the burning and the destruction of Jerusalem. This is the famous burnt house. If you haven't been there, it's worth, it's one of my touch spots when I go to Jerusalem. If I'm even there for a week, I go to the burnt house at least three times. I, I find it very moving and very interesting. Uh, also, um, Masada held out uh, after the destruction of Jerusalem uh, for a few years, uh, but not long. And, of course, the uh, Flavian emperors issued an extensive series of coins to commemorate their victory over this very small land of Judea. It was a very extensive, and indeed it was the, it was the one thing that continued to be referenced during the entire uh, Flavian dynasty. Uh, they all kept referring back to Judea. And even, if you can believe this, even the great-grandson of Agrippa, of Herod the Great, Agrippa II, many of his coins, this the top one is his, and look at the similarity between the Titus issue of Judea Captain. Uh, the only difference is that there, there's a tree here and there's no tree here. And there, but you have the victory and the coins you know, are struck in the comparable time. I mean, there's absolutely no question that Agrippa himself issued coins commemorating the defeat of his own people by uh, his friends, the Flavians. Uh, 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 then there wasn't much that went on in the Holy Land. It was uh, uh, very quiet for the Jewish people, but there was this underground, and when I say underground, I mean literally underground movement of uh, this guy named Bar Kokhba and his followers, his first stronghold was in this place called Betar, and uh, he issued coins during his three-year revolt from 132 to 135. Now remember, this is 62 years after the destruction of Jerusalem. These coins were not issued in Jerusalem, and as far as we know, or Kofba never had Jerusalem as part of his territory. He always wanted to, and that's the reason that the, that he shows the temple, uh, the lulav and the etrog. It's this is this is all by way of yearning. This is the year two of the freedom of Israel. Uh, this says Jerusalem. This says uh, uh, Simon. This says for the freedom of Jerusalem. This says Jerusalem. Uh, this says uh, year one uh, uh, of the freedom of, of Israel. Uh, this says Simon, Prince of Israel. The other thing that I want to tell you about Bar Kokhba coins is that every single one of them that we know of is overstruck on another coin. So Bar Kokhba took the quick way. You know, he had lost the Jewish infrastructure of minting coins because it was destroyed in 70. He did not have a governmental infrastructure. He was very much fly-by-night guy. If you don't believe that, read some of the more comfortable letters. He was, he was all over the place and underground and very, very particular about details. He wanted the coins out there, and the only way they could get them out there fast was to find a way to strike them on other coins. His tetradrams are struck <clears throat> on top of other circulating tetradrams in the area, the zuzium uh, or the denarius-sized coins were struck on denarius or drams. All of the bronzes were struck on other bronzes. And as I say, he was using these Judean symbols. This is the kind of lulav and etrav we use today to celebrate Sukkot. This is a 5th century mosaic. And there is the Bar Kokhba coin uh, uh, struck in the year 133 with the identical uh, symbolism. Um, the temple, again, this is an idealistic temple. Uh, this star above the temple may indeed uh, simply uh, represent uh, a chandelier, uh, 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 an oil chandelier that was hung 
right at the beginning of at the opening of the temple, and this uh, rosette or cross may have represented that. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to show you is uh, this uh, Bar Kokhba land board that I published quite some years ago, but I really like it because it is obviously all the money that this person had. Um, this this came, by the way, from the antiquities market. Uh, I got it from a friend who was a licensed dealer in the '80s, um, and you know it was it was legally purchased, but it's clearly something that was found. And inside this uh, this Herodian style oil lamp were these coins, and this is pretty much the way they looked when when they came in the oil lamp, and when I when I acquired the coins. And you can see here that we have four gold coins: Trajan, Domitian, Hadrian, and Hadrian. And then we have these top coins are silver denarii. It looks like Hadrian, Trajan, Hadrian. Mark Anthony and Anthony is pious, the latest coin in the hoard that dates it. And then look at what is so interesting. Bar Kokhba coins, uh, uh, four different ones with a palm tree, and three Bar Kokhba coins with lyres. But what's fantastic about three, three coins with lyres? One is struck in the year one, one is struck in the year two, and one is struck in the year three. Those coins barely even circulated together, much less being found together as onesies. You know why they they were found together as onesies? Because this is one of the very first Judean coin collections. There was this guy who was put away his coins in the time of Antonius Pius, which was quite some years after the Bar Kokhba revolt, and you could be sure that Bar Kokhba coins were totally worthless at the time. Yet this guy not only saved Bar Kokhba coins, but he saved a year one, a year two, and a year three liar coin. That, to me, is rather amazing for a small lord like this. Well, I know that some of you were hoping that I was going to talk about something else. Uh, and in that case, um, you have my email. It's actually dhemden at numismatics.org or dhemden at gmail. I'll be more than happy to be in touch with any of you I have a really good, uh, uh, I have a really good collection of uh, uh, photographs. If any of you need photographs, and um, uh, I'll, I'll I, uh, if, if, if I can answer any questions, I'll be glad to try. Right. Well, um, thank you very much, David. That's been uh, quite a turn to force. Um, well, let's give you the pause now, and then we'll ask. Uh, we will deal with the questions and maybe give a second round of applause. Thanks. Um, now we come to the questions. Um, I'm looking through the comments. Everyone seems rather happy. Uh, there's one comment here, outstanding presentation. Um, and uh, nobody sort of contradicted that, which is... And it, if we don't have any big questions, that's okay, because... It, so it goes to the... What was the beginner's lecture? But I know that Jacobson is going to ask a question and embarrass. I'm not. I'm not actually. <laughs> uh, we we talk quite frequently, so I can ask questions. I might do if just to get the ball rolling. But honestly, I would very much welcome questions from our large audience here. Uh, I think that because nothing has been written down, um, as in by way of questions, why don't um, the person who wants to ask the question indicate it by raising a hand and then unmuting and asking it directly to the lecturer. Does anyone want to start? I actually, David, I now see a few questions. So here's Ranan. I uh, mean, understand the central element inside the structure in the Barcopa Temple coins. Well, oh, yes. obviously, that's a great question, and it's been discussed. Um, uh, de de uh, my teacher, Dan Barag, uh, uh, wrote rather convincingly that it was a depiction of the showbread table. Uh, I, I'm not sure that the showbread bread table was ubiquitous enough at the time, in spite of the fact that it appeared on uh, a Mattathias Antigonus coin in a different form. Uh, it, it, I like uh, there. Uh, I reference in my new book that there is a 
there's a Talmudic reference to the fact that the um, the ark is covered with a cloth, and the cloth has two uh, two things poking out of the cloth that look like a woman's breasts. And if you take a look at the element inside of the temple, uh, what you see is uh, uh, almost an arc with what some people have described as the end of scrolls. Well, it might indeed be the end of scrolls, or it might be uh, the end of the um, poles that were used to carry the ark. So, you know, I would say it's somewhere between the ark and the showbread table. Um, and uh, but but certainly it it's something that has to do with the messianic imagery of the temple. Well, I would wouldn't go that far, but, but certainly I think it is the ark. I don't think it's a showbread table. I'll tell you why. If you look at um, Roman coins, they that show temples, and there are quite a lot of them. You always have in the center the cult figure, the statue of a god or goddess. Almost invariably, with some Semitic temples, you have a, a or an altar stone, but it's the it's the it's the center of the cult that's shown, and I think that it that the that it, it cannot be the showbread table because that's just an appurtenance. It's got to represent the kernel of the cult, as it were, and the kernel of the Jewish cult was worship of the Almighty God, and what better symbol was there of the Almighty God? Than the ark that sat in the original Solomonic temple, but and that's correct. And and by the way, uh, you know, one of the interesting things is that in Herod's temple, there was no holy ark because the I know scrolls had been lost. So I think that that speaks toward uh, to, toward agreement with David uh, on that. So um, anyway, let's go. Have... Oh, so I was I was going to go ahead to another. Sorry, we have some more questions. Yeah, then I was going to go ahead to Liz. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, who asked about the goddess Athena on the early uh, Yelud coins. And I don't think there's any question about it, Liz. Those are simply copying the most common and international coin of the time. And that was the Athenian uh, tetradrium. And uh, they were just... Uh, it, it, the whole coin was a copy of the Athenian tetradrachm. The head of Athena, the owl. The only difference was that the letters Alpha, Theta, Epsilon in Greek were replaced with Yud, He, Dalet in Hebrew for Yud. Uh, but otherwise, uh, a, a, a large element of those coins were simply uh, copied, uh, um, and, and then they branched off a little bit on their own, but the earliest ones were definitely copied. Um, okay, now I'm... Here's Alexander as a question. Sorry? Alexander has a question. He's the next. Thanks for a lot. You... Oh, hi, Alexander. Yeah, before I get to that one, though, I saw one other one. Uh, Gary Cantor asked... Uh, oh, yes. was mint in Jerusalem during the revolt. Well, we... There is some evidence that it was on the Temple Mount, um, uh, in the precinct of the Temple. Uh, there, there, there was a, a big area there, and it, it makes some sense. Uh, there are, um, there's other evidence that there was a mint in Jerusalem somewhere near uh, today, what we call the Tower of David, near the Jaffa Gate. But the, the, the thing that I, that I also want to shake from your minds is that the mint. The mint may have not been a mint. I mean, maybe there was a main mint for bronze coins in Judea. But you know that uh, 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 our colleague Donald Ariel from the Israel Antiquities Authority has reported on 11 or 12 uh, uh, pieces of limestone molds used for casting blank coins, uh, you know, coin planchets need, that needed to be restruck. And those uh, casting molds were found in 11, 10 or 11 different places around Jerusalem. And those casting bolts have zero value for anything. They're totally worthless. And the fact that fragments of these molds are found all over Jerusalem in a number of places speaks to some form of non-centralized minting. Well, we're now just realizing uh, uh, the benefits of some dye studies of Judean coins 
and seeing that some coins were clearly struck in the same place as other coins, but some coins in certain series were struck al almost by themselves. They didn't have any other linkages. So uh, Alexander, well, uh, Alexander is trying to build a small collection of Judean coins, and he has a Pontius Pilate and a Jewish war prutop. What would I recommend to be the third one? I never recommend what collectors should collect because that's why you're a collector. When, when you see something that's the right thing, you start to get uh, the jitters and you can't rest until you have it. So that's the way, that's the way it works. I mean, honestly, there, there is not a bad choice uh, unless, unless you happen to end up with a forgery. Uh, and I would only say that if you're buying outside of Israel, buy from a reputable dealer. If you're buying from inside of Israel, only deal with somebody who has a license from the Antiquities Authority. Please. I'm, I'm usually buying from U.S. I mean, if you're buying from the U.S., you should buy from reliable people. There's always, you know, I, I look, we, I see forgeries of Jewish coins in auctions all the time. I call people's attention to them. The truth of the matter is that there are not, there are a decreasing number of people who are able to identify forgeries in Judean coins. And there are some new scholars in Israel, but the problem is that most of their exposure to numismatics has been excavation coins. And if you compare excavation coins and museum collection coins or coins in trade, there are tremendous uh, volume difference. And so there is this, there was there was a group of scholars, I count uh, 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 Dan Barag, Yaakov Meshur, uh, Robert Deutsch, some other ones who go, uh, David Jesselson, who I keep mistakenly calling because I know two David J's, it's very difficult. Uh, but so all of those, The, um, next, the next question is actually very pertinent. It's about the ethics of collecting. Aid. Right. Well, I would say that, uh, you know, I just, I just read an article today in the New York Times about how uh, museum directors are feeling increasingly pressured uh, to re return, uh, return objects to certain places. Here's what I have to say. I started collecting uh, and studying ancient Judean coins uh, before 1967, my dad had been a collector through the 50s in St. Louis. But my serious interest of my own started in 67. And I will say that in 67, there was nobody that did not think that people who were collecting coins and small antiquities relating to Judea or specific historical things in the area of Jerusalem and the West Bank, we were heroes. I mean, when I went into an antiquity shop on a, a, a Saturday morning, I would see the famous archaeologists. I would see Moshe Dayan. I would see all of the big name archaeologists of the day would be in the shops in the old city. Uh, now, Israel still has a legal trade in antiquities. I can personally tell you that I myself have seen two or three million Judean coins not legally out of Israel. So at a certain point, in my opinion, Israel will stop the trade in coins and antiquities. Pr probably uh, the trade in coins will continue longer, but the, that doesn't change the fact that there are literally millions of Judean coins in trade. But that's why I say to you that you should deal with a large and well-known dealer uh, because they're very careful. Uh, they're they're uh, in organizations that require them to make sure that when they acquire coins, they're acquired from somebody that truly owns them. So I personally don't have a problem with the ethics of coin collecting unless somebody's going to go out and steal the coins uh, that they're selling. They could be stolen from a re museum or an archaeological site. I just recently wrote a report for uh, for two governments regarding a, a, a coin that was recently returned from the United States to Israel. Um, the, the, one of the silver quarter shekels that had been seized from an auction some years ago. 
uh, that was a coin that should have been returned. But coins were meant to trail. You know, oil lamps, uh, uh, big sculptures, uh, important uh, mosaics. I mean, there were a lot of things that weren't meant to trail. Coins were meant to travel and circulate. And um, and I, as I say, I feel as long as they're in trade legally, they're okay. I don't have an ethical problem. Well, except what about provenance? I mean, the coins are used, David, as a marker of uh, other information, uh, chronology, or, uh, at sites, etc. Uh, also, um, you know, when they're taken out of context, a lot of that information does get lost. You yourself found an oil lamp that contained coins which you believe were lovingly collected by some uh, someone in the second century. Absolutely, you know, if they would have been found, if they would have been traded individually, that information would have disappeared. Well, the, and and the fact of the matter is that if I hadn't grabbed that group, it would have been dispersed as single coins, and nobody would have ever known anything. So, you know, I my own view is that that UK uh, has has the best approach uh, because coins, you know, we cannot say that most coins come from uh, places where there are substantial archaeological excavations. Many, many ancient coins come from places that seem to be unrelated to excavations. They may have been fields where there were fairs. Uh, and as I say, the British law accounts for that. I won't say that the British law corrals every single metal detector find, but they do corral a good percentage of them. Uh, because the finders have a reason to report their finds. And I, frankly, I mean, I've recommended that approach to Israel multiple times at various levels. Uh, they're, they're not interested. Does anyone else have a, this is a, a subject where there are very strong views. Does anyone else want to comment on? That's actually a comment from William Reigns in the, uh, in the chat box. Can you see it? Oh, oh yeah. All right. The wrong coins, Jader, last to our... So William's question is a really good question. Also, um, are the known coins generally official issues or is there significant evidence for ancient imitators? In the Judean series, there is an extensive series of imitative bronzes that we call irregular coins. We suspect that those coins were struck in some of those small mints that I was talking about and that they were struck to fill market needs at particular times because there's every bit of evidence that the officials in Judea issued coins sporadically, uh, not necessarily every year or even regularly over the course of a year, but big numbers of coins came out and then maybe they didn't issue new ones. So maybe there was a market in Hebron that didn't have enough bronze coins. So some guys uh, started making some bronze coins, and that accounts for irregular issues of Judean bronze pruta coins that were not made in a central mint. But nevertheless, the really interesting thing here is that according to our archaeological evidence, those coins were not separated from the other coins. They all circulated together, and therefore they're very much like United States Civil War tokens or Canadian Condor tokens that were minted privately but entered circulation with the tacit agreement and understanding of the population that was using the coins and the government that was observing these coins that were technically not legal, but they were absolutely, those were one cent coins. They were little coins. 100 were to a dollar. Well, the Pruta coins, there were more than 100 to the dollar. So they were tiny, insignificant coins. So these imitative bronze, and sometimes we say, wow, it's almost crude. Is it crude enough to be an imitation? And in that case, sometimes we have to die match uh, the other side or die match it with other coins. But we have definitely shown that the irregular issues of Judea not only look more irregular, but they have more irregular metallurgy and more irregular striking. Um, right. All that has. We'll take one more question, I think, and then we'll 
wrap this very engaging conversation to an end. Uh, anybody else? Well, it says, Lola asked if there were any significant differences at the time of Jesus between how men and women used coins. Oh, okay. the, the answer to that question is a very clearly that we don't know. Uh, uh, the, first of all, bronze coins are never even mentioned in the entire book of Josephus. And in fact, the only time that he really mentions silver coins is when, or gold coins, is when Roman soldiers are gutting some of the Jews who were killed in Jerusalem because they swallowed their gold and silver coins to hide them from the Romans. And they, when they slit them up and they found the coins in it, if you read, the, it's a very bloody passage of Josephus. Um, but, but the answer of all that is we don't know. But I think that one thing that you can say is that in the time of Jesus, the men were out more and the women were inside more, although we don't know what the women's role in the market was, in the food market. And again, remember, what you think of as a market, even a street market today, even the Jerusalem Shuk, that's not the way it was 2,000 years ago. It was different. Exactly how? I can't tell you. But I can tell you that it was as different as it was before you had a telephone that didn't need to be plugged into the wall. Well, I think that's been very fascinating. Uh, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, let's thank David very much for a very entertaining and engaging presentation. Um, there are lots of questions that people will have afterwards. Um, David, you don't mind pe uh, people contacting you? Yep, feel free to contact me uh, either directly or via BANS, whatever. I'm glad to help. Uh, if, if I can help you, uh, you know, look at projects, if you need photographs to illustrate articles, we got it. Well, thank you so much. And um, I'll, uh, as I say, let's bring an end to this. Have uh, an enjoyable evening. Yeah. Wonderful to see you earlier at the day. Thank you. See you goodbye. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you much. Yes, sorry. Uh, well, I first wanted to uh, show our expression of uh, uh, what she does, appreciation. And then if any, if Sheila, if you want to say anything, we can ask them. Um, not specifically, other than we will be inviting you to our next lecture on the 19th of um, January, uh, when Professor Jonathan Adler will be speaking, but I won't be dealing with that for two or three weeks, but I certainly will circulate people and uh, hope to see as many of you as possible. Thank you very much indeed, David. That was a fabulous lecture. Thank you, and goodbye to everybody. Bye. Thanks. Inshallah. Goodbye. Thanks, David.